right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're tuning in from today. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, if this is your first time joining Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we are all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. So if you visit exploringbytheseat.com, you can find a ton uh, of events each month that your classrooms can join in too. So November has been a pretty awesome month. We've been celebrating conservation, talking to scientists, uh, to explorers, to conservationists around the world uh, who have dedicated their life to protecting ecosystems as well as the incredible biodiversity uh, that they support. Today is also a special day, kind of a double header. Not only are we celebrating conservation, but coming up over the weekend is World Fisheries Day. So we've been connecting with scientists uh, and researchers from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans here in Canada and learning about the work that they are doing uh, to help protect species in our ocean as well as our freshwater environments. So I'm gonna introduce Kevin Hedges now. Kevin has been a research scientist with Fisheries and Oceans Canada since 2010. So he studies Arctic marine fishes and invertebrates. Through his research program, uh, he supports sustainable management of commercial fisheries for things like the Greenland halibut uh, and the Northern and striped shrimp. Uh, also, he's looking at developing new community-based fisheries in places like Nunavut. Uh, also really cool, he's a member of the Ocean Tracking Network uh, researching patterns uh, and habitat use of species like the Greenland shark and Arctic skate. So really excited to have Kevin joining us. Hey, let's bring him live into the call here. How are we doing today, Kevin? Good. Yourself? Excellent. Excellent. I think you're joining us from Manitoba today. That's right. Snowy Winnipeg. Snowy Winnipeg. Well, we're just next door in Ontario. We've had a few little dustings, but I think it's going to get, uh, it's going to catch up with us eventually, but it's, uh, it's great to have you joining us today. We're excited to learn a little bit more about uh, the work that you do. Uh, and when you're ready, go ahead and share screen. I'll let you take over for a bit. Okay. All right. I can see it loading up. And we are full screen. We're good to go. Okay. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, so thank you for, for inviting me to give this this talk, this uh, this discussion. Um, so, yes, I'm Kevin Hedges. I'm with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada. And so my I'm here as a research scientist, and I study Arctic marine fishes and uh, related fisheries. So just a little bit of a bit more of a bio, I guess. So I, um, since you're, you know, this is geared towards students, I thought I'd go on with the education aspect of it very briefly. Uh, so obviously, I you know I went to elementary school and high school. After that, I got a bachelor's of science in ecology and evolution, and then a master's of science and a doctor of philosophy. So I've, you know, I've spent a lot of time in school to to get to where I am today. Uh, part of that time, it was sort of an internship, the master's and the the doctorate. You know, you're working and studying at the same time and getting paid a little bit as you go along. Uh, but in, in my my philosophy with that was, I wanted a job that I was going to enjoy. And, and I'm lucky enough that I, you know, I spend so much of my time at work uh, and away doing field work. Uh, but you know, I, I have a job that I love, which is it makes all the difference. It makes it a lot easier to get up in the morning and go to work. So I'm going to talk to you about um, again Arctic marine fisheries. So at the bottom is a map of Canada. Can you see the mouse cursor moving or not? Yep, yeah, we can see it. Yes, I think so. So this yellow box in the bottom map. Is, is marking off sort of the Eastern Canadian Arctic where I work. And that matches with a little bit of rotation, the map to the right. So this is Baffin Island, and then Baffin Bay is to the east of it. And the little bits of land you can see just in the very Eastern edge of the map on the right side is Greenland. So most of my work happens in Baffin Bay uh, between Canada and Greenland. And so we Canada has a number of Arctic commercial fisheries. Uh, Currently, we have fisheries for Greenland halibut and northern and striped shrimp, and these happen in Baffin Bay uh, that are their offshore fisheries. And we have one community-based commercial fishery for Greenland halibut in, in Cumberland Sound, which is uh, purely prosecuted or fished by the community of Pangerton. There's also a number of communities that would like to develop fisheries. So just to go a little bit more information on the offshore Greenland halibut fishery. So all of the green area is, you know, people can fish for Greenland halibut in all those areas. The offshore fishery is, is marked by this orange outline. So the offshore boats fish in that area. It's deeper water. It's, it's away from communities. Uh, and they, that's where they catch most of their fish. 
And so the fishery out there uses a combination of bottom trawling and gill netting primarily. There's also, like I say, the community-based fishery in Cumberland Sound. So this body of water here is Cumberland Sound. Uh, the community of Pangerton is the only community adjacent to it. And so rather than, you know, the offshore fishery uses large boats with large nets, the, the Pangerton fishery is done through the winter. So they go out, skidoo out on the sea ice, cut holes in the, in the ice, and they set a long line. So they'll set about 100 hooks at a time to catch Greenland halibut, and they take them back to the community and they're processed in the community. They have a, a fish plant there where people are hired to, to process the fish. And so it's, you know, we've got summer offshore and winter um, in, in, the, in Pangerton. And just to give you a bit of a, a scale, for those of you from Ontario or, or are familiar with the Great Lakes at least, Cumberland Sound, this body of water in the yellow box, is about the same size as Lake Ontario, surface area-wise. So that's about the size of, of Lake Ontario. It's much deeper though. We also have offshore fisheries for northern and striped shrimp. So again, all of the pink area can be fished by, by commercial boats for, for shrimp. And this orange outline again, that's where most of the fishing actually happens. So even though there's a large area boats can fish, uh, most of the vessels, you know, they, they don't spend the year in Nunavut. When they're finished fishing, they go south, they get away from the ice that forms in the winter. Uh, so, you know, when they come north, they don't want to go any further than they have to to get the, to catch the, the fish that they want or the shrimp that they want. So this is where most of the fishing actually happens for shrimp. And then emulating, you know, so of course, communities see what has happened in Pangerton. So Kikatarjuak, Clyde River and Pond Inlet are all, you know, obviously right next door to the offshore fishery. And they've all expressed interest and have done some work on their own to try and develop uh, winter fisheries. So something very similar to what happens in Cumberland Sound. And with D through DFO, uh, part of the work that I do is to support the, the development of community-based fisheries. So while they're doing some fishing in the winter, we've gone in with boats and done some sampling in the summer to try and get more information and to understand how the, the fish that are in, that they might fish here in the winter, how are they related to the fish that are caught in the offshore? Just to help um, understand the, the overall impacts that multiple fisheries could have on the Greenland halibut population. So there's interest in developing Arctic fisheries uh, is primarily because there just, there aren't a lot of jobs. So there, there's food security issues in the North. You know, people, their food is scarce. Uh, as you can see, this is Clyde River. So this is about two thirds of the way up Baffin Island. There are no trees. There's very little vegetation. There are short shrubs that are around, lots of blueberries, cranberries. There, there is a, an amazing amount of, of production that happens in the area, but nothing, if you, you would not have farms. Um, so people hunt and fish traditionally for food. And so at the same time, you know, there's, there's just, there's not a lot of regular jobs of what we would consider regular down here. So fisheries provide one of the, the few potential new jobs in Arctic communities. People currently do a, still a lot of traditional work. They hunt, they fish. Uh, some of that has turned into people running guiding companies or um, outfitting companies. So people can go up for vacation and go on a hunting or fishing trip. And you know, there's a, people still do uh, a lot of traditional crafts and arts that are created. Uh, some for functional use, a lot of clothing that they that, you know, made it a seal skin that people wear and arts that are traded and sold, uh, particularly as cruise ships come through in the summer. So there's a bit of economy there. There are very few stores. Usually most towns have two grocery stores and not a lot more. Uh, there's the elementary school and a high school, town council, utilities like water, road, road maintenance, road clearing, and, and the airport. And that's that's about all you can count on in most communities. There's not a lot much more. So fisheries are, are an important opportunity. So to support the, the maintenance of, of our current fisheries and to ensure they're happening in a sustainable way and to support development of new fisheries, uh, DFO goes out and we conduct a lot of surveys. So most of our surveys involve bottom trawling. Um, so the bottom trawl, I'll show you a diagram in a, in a minute. It's a large net that we drag along the bottom of the ocean and it collects information on a variety of fish and invertebrates. So we're not only getting information on 
the species that is either being fished or of, or that's interest to be fished, we're getting an idea of the whole community that's down there. What are the other fish that might be eating those, the Greenland halibut? What might they be foraging on? What might, what might the Greenland halibut be eating? Uh, and the same thing with invertebrates. You know, we see shrimp, we see all sorts of other invertebrates come up as well. So we use that data for stock assessments to support fishery management. So we, we look at um, changes in catches across time. So from year to year to estimate, you know, how, how healthy is this population? Is it growing? Is it getting smaller? Is it staying pretty much the same? Do we see a lot of old individuals, a lot of young individuals? You know, there's a, a lot of different things we can look at from the survey data to idea, have an idea of whether that fishery is, as it's currently happening, is being sustainable or not. And we also use the data for biodiversity monitoring. So we're, you know, we're out there, there's an economic incentive to support the surveys, to support fisheries. But we're, again, with the trawl, we collect da data on a variety of species. And so this gives us an opportunity to, to look at the whole community, so the biodiversity of its, what's there. In some cases, like we went up to Pond Inlet at the north end of, of Baffin Island. The, the bottom trawl survey I did there was the first survey in the area. So it was brand new information for the, the area. We'd never trawled there before. And, and this provides us with information that we can then go back and look at through time to see you know, how is climate change affecting marine communities? How, are, how is shipping, tourism, changes in, in human activities affecting the, the marine biodiversity, the whole community, which is, you know, it, it's, it's the life of, of, our, of, our, uh, of our oceans and for communities that are adjacent to it, you know, that's where people get a lot of their food as well. So there's a, a lot of vested interest in ensuring that our oceans stay healthy. So for bottom trawling, this is a, a, just a quick schematic. So obviously you've got the large survey vessel up top and the bottom trawl runs right along the bottom of the ocean. And so we're, we're, we're obviously not catching fish that are up in the water column. We're only catching fish that are on the bottom and the net is towed along and it, you know, it, it sort of herds fish into the net and then we bring the net up and see what's what we actually caught. So this is a, an actual trawl on our survey vessel. And so the, the green mesh is and the orange mesh, that's the meshing of the of the trawl itself. These balls, so that are various colors, are floats that are on the top of the net that help hold it up, to help the, the top of it up. And this these black rubber discs, these are actually pieces of old tire, and there's a really heavy chain that runs through them. And that's what runs along the ocean bottom. So the, the by using old pieces of tire, it helps it roll over rocks without disturbing so much of the bottom, but still catches fish because they get scared up off the bottom and into the trawl. So when the trawl comes up, you know, it comes up the back of the ship and it's a very large net. You can see it's scaled to a person. It's, it's quite large. So we use winches um, and cranes to actually lift the net up. And so this net has been emptied already. One of these deck plates lifts up and the fish get dumped into a, a room that's below there and then it gets closed down. And then we work on the, the lower deck. So we're, we're not exposed to the air. We're one level lower. And at this back wall, you can see these gray doors is where we can access the fish. That's where they get dumped in that room behind. And then we sort through the catch here. So this is me standing at a conveyor belt. Greenland halibut, I've left on that on the belt and they're going into baskets. And I'm there picking out all the other invertebrates and fish and putting them into these gray tubs that are on the side to help us. So we do a sort and then we actually start measuring individuals. We do similar things on smaller vessels closer to shore. So this is, again, it's a, it's a bottom trawl. This is on a boat that's about a third of the size of the one we use offshore, so not nearly so big. Um, this is actually me standing at the bottom of the trawl. So instead of that big, long green net that you could see before, this is the bottom end of the, of the trawl. And that's what we've caught. So a very different scale of, of collection. And we're also, of course, interested in the things that the fish that we're catching eat. So we do zooplankton toes. This is um, a zooplankton net. The mesh size is 500 micrometers. So it's about you know, half a millimeter. So it's very fine. It's like a really big, heavy pantyhose uh, that we're putting into the ocean and we pull up. The water strains out and, and small zooplankton get left in it. So the bottom trawl survey is, like I said, we, we get a variety of fish. So we're interested in Greenland halibut, which is this fish on the left. 
But this is actually a small Greenland halibut. Um, and then we have Atlantic poachers, polar sculpin. This is a species of eel pout. We get Arctic skates. These two were actually very small Arctic skates. They're about the size of the palm of my hand. Uh, they were newly hatched. They come out of egg cases. Uh, this is another species of eel pout, a rockling, an Arctic cod. And Arctic cod are particularly important. We don't sample them well in our bottom trawl. They're up in the water column more. But Arctic cod are the main forage fish of the Arctic ecosystem. They, they eat zooplankton. There's lots of them. They grow very quickly. They reproduce very quickly. And they are, they're eaten by greenland halibut, other fishes, uh, marine birds, seals, beluga whales, bo uh, uh, narwhal. They are a, a very important species. We call it a keystone species in the ecosystem. If they were to disappear, the Arctic marine ecosystem would fall apart. Uh, at least in the short term. So they're very important. And then, of course, we get a number of invertebrates. So these are shrimp. So these, um, these are the, sh the shrimp that are being caught and used for the fishery. Uh, also sea urchins. These are rock shrimp, this one at the bottom. So it lives right on the bottom, whereas the, the pink shrimp are a little bit up off the bottom. And sea spiders, which look pretty creepy, and they move very slowly when we see them. Basket stars, sea cucumbers. Uh, some zooplankton that don't show up very well. These pink ones are a little easier to see. So these are really big zooplankton. We catch the occasional squid. And everywhere you go, there are jellyfish of different types. So in addition to bottom trawls, we also do long line surveys. And so this is particularly in Cumberland Sound. Um, and the reason that we do both is long lines are what the communities are using. So that's what they use in, in Cumberland Sound for the winter fishery. And it's what the uh, Pond Inlet, Kikitarjuak, and Clyde River are looking at using for, for developing fisheries because it's, they're, it's very simple gear. It doesn't require a large boat. So it's, it's cheaper to get started. They can use the, the boats they have now to get things started. And they're far more selective. So the, the way a, ground, a long line works is there's a heavy rope that lies on the bottom and it's weighted. And there's a series of small ropes that come off with hooks. And then at either end of the line, there's an anchor and a rope that goes all the way to the surface with a couple of floats on it. So we can leave this to sit for about 12 hours, come back, grab one set of floats and start hauling the long line up from one end. And so we, of course, like a trawl is going along the bottom and it's, it's herding fish and it's catching whatever's in front of it. The long line is only going to catch fish that are hungry. They have to be interested in coming to, a, to bite what's on the hook. Uh, we would have a piece of squid on this on the hook, so it has to be hungry, it has to be interested in what we put on the hook, and it has to be big enough to actually get the hook in its mouth. So they're, they're very selective. They're, it's, they can be much cleaner fisheries with, a lot, with less uh, incidental catch. But they are more labor intensive. So this is the, the smaller vessel that we use for the trawl. So you can see this orange mesh at the top is actually that bottom trawl, that last bottom trawl I showed you. This black line is the ground line. So that's the long line that we set down on the bottom. And so this, this pile of line here that would be about 400 meters long, and there are 200 hooks. So all of that goes into one of these tubs. So we normally have four tubs that we set at the same time. So we would set uh, more than a kilometer of line and 800 hooks that are baited. And we have to bait them by hand. We don't have a machine to bait them for us. So you know, every afternoon we go out and we have uh, we have lunch and we go out and we have a, a baiting party. We turn on some music and sit on the deck and put little pieces of squid on little hooks. It uh, it's more fun than it sounds actually. So when we're finished, this is what we hope it looks like. We have a tub with a big coil of rope and all these little pieces of line. Each one has a hook on the end of it and a squid on the end of it, and then that spools off the back of the the ship when we set it. And this is what we're looking for is Greenland halibut. So this is a, a very good size Greenland halibut that we've that was caught in Cumberland Sound. So of course, when we're fishing, what we want to see is the line come up and have a Greenland halibut on it. So this is perfect. It's a nice calm day and we've caught a, the fish we want. We don't always catch the fish we want. This is a Greenland shark that took one of our hooks instead of a Greenland halibut. Um, so it came up 
we would not bring it on deck. We just take the hook out of its mouth and let the shark go over the side of the deck. And we're very fortunate that Greenland shark are really the only shark we encounter in these fisheries. And uh, certainly in Cumberland Sound where we're long lining and they're, they're very lethargic. They, they're like a, a, a tree sitting in the water. They don't thrash around. They're not like pictures that you see on of movies of great white sharks or, or other sharks that are, you know, thrashing around and trying to bite you. These guys just lie there calmly and let us take the hook out. And then they swim off very slowly. They're very, very laid back as far as sharks go, but also quite large. So they're still heavy to handle. And for any of you that have been fishing, obviously the line does not always come back the way you want it. Just like when you're using a fishing rod, we get tangles. For whatever reason, it set it on a stormy day, a shark bumped something around, whatever. Uh, we get these big snarls. So this is a, a whole pile of rope. This would be about 200 meters of, of our ground line with about 100 hooks in the, mixed in through it. Uh, and so, you know, we, we bring that up and we, we untangle it. Uh, so consequently, I have three kids and when anything gets tangled at home, it's my job to straighten it out again. Got lots of practice. And we do catch a few things. We don't get the same diversity of fish that we catch in the trawling surveys with the long lines, but we do get Greenland halibut and Greenland sharks and the occasional Arctic skate. Uh, and even rarer, we'll get grenadier, which is this guy. Um, we'll catch some sponge. We occasionally get uh, snails or whelk that have attached themselves to it, soft corals, starfish, basket stars, uh, and some and other invertebrates, some cnidarians. And so you'll get a, a small variety of things coming up, but not nearly as much as we see with the bottom trawls. And when we get the fish on the deck, of course, we want to collect more information about them. So we put them on a board, we measure their length, they record their weight, we count the number of, of individuals for every species that we catch, we weigh um, the total weight for each species as well. And for some things, we do dissections where we'll take aging structures out to see how old the individual is, uh, take tissue samples for genetics to look at how populations are related and how fish are moving, uh, and also some tissues for food web analyses where we look at uh, stable isotope signatures that allow us to uh, approximate what, indi what that individual is eating from different species. But of course, we're not always the first one to get to our catch. Uh, with the trawl, it comes up very quickly. With the long lines, you know, sometimes you catch a fish early on in the set, and so the hooks go in the water, it catches a fish, and that fish sits there for a while. And in this case, it was a Greenland halibut that a Greenland shark tried to bite three times, and well, it bit it. Um, this Greenland halibut came up with some of the, the, the heavy ground line of the long line wrapped around it. So the shark was able to bite, but not bite through. So we have one, two, three crescent bites where this shark tried to bite through it. And it's, you know, when I took it off the hook, it just looked like a ribbon, but it did go back together. There was nothing missing, but uh, you know, we don't always get there first. It is a fish eat fish world. So in addition to doing our surveys, we also, as was mentioned, I'm part of the ocean tracking network. So obviously we can't be up north and fish all year round. So we, we look for ways to collect data when we're not there to get a better idea of how fish are behaving all year round. So this is where electronic tags come in. Uh, so we have a couple of different types. We have acoustic tags that go, they get surgically put into the fish. And these tags have a, a unique signature. So every few seconds, it, it sends out a, a pulse, a small um, sound wave that encodes it's kind of like your like a remote control for a for a TV set. Uh, you know, it, it encodes information in that pulse, so it's a unique identify unique number that every fish has. So when we hear those pulses with other instruments, we know what which fish that was specifically, not just that there is a fish in the area. And we also use satellite tags. So these ones are attached to the outside of the animals. Um, so like here on the back of the shark, or on the back of the skates, or on the back of the Greenland halibut. And so these go on, they record um, location if they get it close to the surface. So you can get a, a series of locations for where the fish was through time. Um, usually they have at least a temperature sensor. So it's recording the water temperature where the fish is swimming. And then at a, a programmed date, it releases from the, the animal. There's a little wire that corrodes through. Um, and then the tag comes off, floats to the surface, 
transmits all of the data, it's collected to a satellite, we can download that data. And then we, you know, we have an idea of where the animal has been while it's been uh, away from us. So just quickly go through the, the fish tracking with the, the acoustic tags. So obviously something has to be listening for those tags. So we put out a number of moorings and we have these spread out all through Baffin Island, through Baffin Bay, sorry, and some of the inshore waters near the communities. And so what, that, what it consists of is just a, a hard foam float, a piece of rope. This is the instrument, uh, it's what they call a VR2, that's listening for the, the tags that we put inside the fish. This is a release. So basically it's, it's listening as well, but it's not listening for the fish tags, it's listening for us to come back with, a, with another hydrophone and we can send it a signal saying, let go from the bottom. And basically all this is, it's a, it's a piece on the top that's listening for our, for our command. And the bottom is basically like a, 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 an electric drill that has a, there's a nut on the bottom and when it gets the command to release, it turns this drill part turns on and it unscrews very slowly from the a nut on the bottom. And then the top part of the mooring comes to the surface with the instrument and the release and this piece of chain and the anchor stay on the, on the ocean floor. So we'll set these in several hundred meters of water um, and every, you know, and we leave them for a year and then come back and pick them up. So when a fish with a tag comes by, it swims by, the tag is emitting pulses of, of its identification, and the VR2 is listening for and recording the time when that fish was there. So it records uh, the time and the, the identity of that fish. And then when we come back a year following, we send down our release command, and the mooring comes to the top, release, release and above, and the chain and the anchor stay on the bottom. So obviously we have to do surgery to put these the acoustic tags inside the fish. So for the Greenland halibut, we have a small lab space on the research vessel. So we bring the fish in, turn them on their side, uh, put them to sleep. So we anesthetize them, make a small incision, put a, a cleaned tag into the fish. And then I'm in the picture, I'm tying a suture. So we're suturing the, the fish closed. Then we put them in a recovery tank to make sure they, they recover from the, the surgery and then release them back into the wild. For Greenland shark, uh, obviously they're a lot bigger and it would be you know, dangerous for us and the shark to try and bring them onto the deck itself. So in their case, we get into a Zodiac. And so we'll bring the shark up along the side of the Zodiac. We roll them onto their back. Again, Greenland shark are very docile, so this isn't really an issue. Uh, and so they, we roll them onto their back they basically go to sleep at that point. It's called tonic immobility. And then we need same same thing with the Greenland halibut, make a small suture, put the tag in and stitch it shut. And then we release the shark. So when we're putting up the moorings, this is just to give you an idea. Here's a float and these are all floats on the side. Uh, this person is holding, that's the, the instrument that's listening for the tags. This person is holding a release. So that's actually, you can see a, a yellow release over here as well. And this piece this, uh, of iron sitting up on the railing is the actual disc anchor. So when we get close to where we want to put in a mooring, oops, long, long way, the first person throws the float over. The second person then throws out the release once the, it's the, the float is clear of the ship. The next person holds onto the rope just below the, the release. So we've got the float, the VR2, the release. We're making sure that none of it hits the boat and gets broken. And then we're right on the station where we want it. We just push the anchor off the side and the whole thing sinks straight to the bottom and they go down very quickly. And then we leave them there for a year and come back and pick them up and download the data and see who visited it. So in addition to Canadian fisheries, um, of course, being part of the federal government, we have international responsibilities. And as one of um, the few Arctic nations, we are part of processes around the central Arctic Ocean. So at the moment, there's a, a moratorium to prevent the development of new fish, new commercial fisheries in the central Arctic Ocean in the high seas portion. So that's right here in the middle. And <coughs> the moratorium is in place until we can run a science program to collect information on what species are present, uh, linkages between species. So again, who's eating whom and to identify any impacts that a fishery might have both on the, the fish that would be targeted, as well as the rest of the ecosystem. What, what habitat impacts might there be? 
Uh, would we be taking food away from marine mammals? You know, what, what are the, the ecosystem level impacts that a fishery might have? And so the, the research that we do, just as a bit of a recap, um, you know, we're supporting sustainable management of existing fisheries and sustainable development of new fisheries. We're doing biodiversity monitoring. And we also, you know, the information we collect on, on species distributions and habitat use feeds into conservation programs, uh, particularly around planning marine protected areas and conservation areas. So the last few years, DFO has developed three fairly large um, conservation areas. So these are areas that are closed to commercial fishing in, in Baffin Bay. So the, the data we've collected from our surveys fed directly into the process of identifying where those locations should be. And so the process, you know, we as scientists, we don't make the decisions. We do our research, um, we do analyses, and we provide advice to managers and politicians. And we do research uh, outreach programs, like, like talking to students, uh, to you know, put the information out there about the state of ecosystems and how things are changing. And you know, we've, so we provide that advice and the, the actual decisions are made by managers and politicians who are balancing um, a, a number of different factors in, in trying to make those decisions. You know, how will, how will a decision affect the people that live close to that area and rely on that, that ecosystem in some way? So that's the, the end of my talk. Uh, hopefully I didn't go too long. And so thank you for your attention. Um, you're not quite the captive audience that I'm used to in field work. But this has been wonderful. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All right, Kevin. Great. Thank you so much for sharing uh, the work that you're doing in the Arctic. Uh, you know, myself being a huge shark fan, love seeing a little bit of that Greenland shark action. That was pretty cool. Um, but it looks like you're doing some great work. And it's pretty exciting to explore some spots for biodiversity that no one has before. So that's pretty awesome. All right. Well, let's meet some of our classrooms. So those who are tuning in via... Um, YouTube, feel free to send a few questions in and let's visit a few of our groups. I'm going to introduce one group who's tuning in. Uh, Mrs. Camelli's class is joining from Aurora, Ontario. So they're in the call uh, with no mic. So they're going to send in some questions via the chat. I'll keep an eye out for those. But uh, let's uh, meet our first group here. So I'm going to bring in Mrs. Hansen's group. They are, there they are. They're joining us in Surrey, British Columbia. How are we doing today, grade four or fives? Good. Good. Excellent. So cool. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Does anyone have a question for Kevin? <laughs> All right, Mrs. Hansen, go ahead and pick one. Hey, Sorry, we were muted. Um, okay. I was wondering when you're out on the boat, how cold is it? Oh, that, that entirely depends on the time of year. So usually um, this, there's too much sea ice around through July. So I don't usually get up to the Arctic until the first week of August. And that's when there's enough open water for us to go up. And at that point, it's usually, you know, the daytime highs would be about 15 degrees. And it's getting down close to freezing at night, um, usually just a little bit above freezing. And I've seen mosquitoes when I'm up at that point, and they're just, you know, they just creep through the air towards you. You can actually dodge it at the way. Um, when we're up in November, it's much colder, and the ice is forming, and it's barely above freezing. Wow. All right. Uh, how big are the boats? How big are the boats? The, so the, the red research vessel that I showed you is uh, about 120 meters long. And the um, smaller blue boat that we use for inshore water is um, oh, 65 feet. So that would be um, like 30 meters, 35 meters long. All right. Great questions. Get us started, Mrs. Hansen's group. We'll try and swing back uh, your way in a moment. But I want to check in with our group in Toronto, Ontario, with Mrs. Uh, Hanks joining us. I'm going to see if we can get them in. Are you still there, Sarah's virtual class? Yep. Hi, we're here. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. We'd love to grab a question or two. Okay. Catherine, what's your question? My question is, um, how big is a great white shark? A great white shark? Um, well, they can get six feet or bigger. 
that, which is smaller than our Greenland shark. So our, our Greenland shark, the, the biggest one I've caught was four meters, which would be um, about eight feet. Yeah, I, I think than that, though. I think some don't realize that Greenland sharks, I think they can get up uh, up to around, you know, maybe even like 20 feet or more and be, you know, 200 years or older, which is pretty incredible. There's yep. the class. They're all virtual. Hey, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Hi. Yeah. Sneak in another question. Hello. Oops. Hello. Okay. Anybody? Any other question? Uh, Morris. How big is a blue whale? <laughs> ah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I'm not really sure how big a blue whale is. It depends on how old it is, I guess. That's the glib answer. Uh, but they are they are massive. They are much bigger than our research vessels. All right. Definitely some marine biology questions there. Um, I don't know the size off the top of my head, but I know that their heart can be as big as like a Volkswagen bug. Uh, and I mean, that's, that's, it's not a huge car, but heart the size of a car is still pretty darn impressive. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very cool. Thank you, Toronto. Um, let's see here. Miss Curry's group. I'm going to bring them into the call. Miss Curry's group are joining us from Calgary, Alberta. Uh, let's get them in here with us. Here we go. How are you Hi, doing, Alberta? Good. How are you doing? Good, good. Thanks for joining us today. Can you hear me okay? We got gotcha. you. Okay, awesome. Um, one of our students is wondering, what is the most dangerous incident that's ever happened to you out at sea? Ooh. Um, well, our, our worst accident was we had someone break his thumb. He um, got a, a piece of rope caught around it, and it got, it got pinched. Um, so we had to... Uh, we were about 12 hours travel away from the, the closest community. So we stopped what we were doing and took him back. And he had a, a spiral fracture through his thumb. The The scariest incident, though, was we had one person just completely pass out. Um, it looked like he was having a stroke, but he, he wasn't at the end of it. He just, um, well, there was low blood sugar. But again, you know, same deal. When someone has, a, has an accident like that, has an incident, we stopped what we were doing. We headed for the closest community and... Uh, in the north, there's there's a small nurse's station in every community. Actually, the, the station's pretty big, but there's like usually one nurse there. And so for the for both of them, they got looked at locally and then flown to a Callowitz and the, the broken thumb went to Ottawa actually for treatment. So it's um, you know, we don't we don't take accidents as lightly at all. But fortunately, nothing worse than that, but that was scary enough. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, Ms. Curry's group, if you have one more, we'll steal it. Um, yeah, so these are grade seven, so they just finished studying interactions and ecosystems, and we had one student who was curious about indicator species in this area. Ah, good question. So, yeah, so we, you know, something that's going to be sensitive and, and informative. Um, that's a challenging one. So that is part of what we're, we're working on with the, with the biodiversity surveys, is trying to identify species that are good indicators so obviously arctic cod is something that we watch to see what how it how it changes because it's so important to the ecosystem but there's so many of them that they're not changes aren't really um aren't, aren't really sensitive you know it would take a, a big change in the ecosystem before you saw a change in the arctic cod population uh so we would look more at some of the the sculpins depending on what it is so near mines we typically look at sculpin species because they're they're, they're localized. They don't move around very much. They don't re they reproduce, but not really quickly. So they're they're more of a sort of a, a good canary in the coal mine for for what's going on locally. Thank you so much. Joe, you're muted. Oh, there we go. There we go. Uh, Mrs. Ball's class is joining us in Godrich. How are we doing today, everyone? Good. Good. Great. Good. Awesome. All right. Well, we'd love to steal a question or two. Can you come up and ask your question? Um, is there any illegal fishing going on? <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there are always, every year, there are our conservation and protection group does investigations. Um, very rarely does it, does it turn into charges. Every once in a while, someone is charged with fishing. Uh, it's, it's a complicated area for, for that because every, so, for the offshore, it's kind of cut and dry. You know, if people go fishing into a, in a closed area, that, that's a pretty obvious no-no. Um, for communities, you know, there's a lot of um, 
you know, people live off the land. So there's there's a, a certain amount of fishing that everyone's allowed to do for subsistence. So even before you start selling something, you can go fishing just for food for your family. And so that makes it a, a harder harder aspect. You know, there's not really any any charges in those situations. So unless someone was trying to sell fish that they'd caught without having a license, but that doesn't typically happen. Oh, nice. <laughs> All right, we'll bring our group in one more time. You guys have another question? Anybody have another question? Um, like, why did he choose Arctic rather than like, like you know? Did you hear that? So why did I choose Arctic research? Yeah, why did you choose Arctic instead of tropic? <laughs> or anywhere else. Ah, well, actually, or anywhere else. Yeah, no, that's, that's a fair question. So I grew up in Ontario. So I grew up around the Great Lakes. And, and that was what I was used to. My master's work was on walleye and Lake Erie. And it wasn't until I, I and actually my, my PhD work was in freshwater in, Lake, in Manitoba as well. Uh, so it wasn't until I joined DFO that I started working in the Arctic. Uh, I'd never been up before, so this was a new job, but I had a background in working on fish and community ecology. So the, the math that I had to use for the analyses uh, translates very well. My biggest change was, um, so I went from the Great Lakes to Lake to Cumberland Sound to start with, which I guess, as I mentioned earlier, Cumberland Sound on the surface is about the same size as Lake Ontario. Uh, but, you know, in Lake Ontario, 100 meters is deep. In Cumberland Sound, we're fishing down to 1,400 meters, so more than a kilometer. And that, to me, was the biggest change. It's like, you know, it's I had to add a zero. What I used to think was deep is now shallow, and what you know, now deep is, is a, an order of magnitude worse. Uh, so it was more a, 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 just a, an, an effect of what job was available, but I honestly wouldn't go back. And, and when I was doing my master's work, my supervisor, half the lab worked in the Great Lakes and half the work, lab worked in the tropics on coral reef fishes and um, I don't know I'm my physiology is built more for cold weather I I can always put clothes on and stay warm there's only so much I can stay off take off and and not go to jail so uh, I've always worked better in temperate to and now arctic climates all right fair enough so I mentioned we had a group who was joining us um where did they go oh our group in Aurora Ontario they sent in a couple questions via the chat uh, one of them is about the extreme weather conditions you encounter while out on the water. On the water, and another one is curious about: Have you ever pulled anything up in the trawl and just been like, "Whoa!" You know, something <laughs> that you just weren't expecting. Uh, yeah. So extreme weather, we certainly get. Uh, we all the pictures that I showed you today. I think all of them were from pretty calm days. We don't tend to take a lot of pictures on rough days because, yeah, you know, you've. If we're still working, you've got one hand holding onto the ship and one hand doing whatever your job is, so you're not getting tossed around. And on really rough days, you're just holding onto the ship. Um, the the worst I've been in, uh, we had one one day where we were going. Um, there was a storm coming off the land, and um, so it, because we're we're typically up late summer, early fall when there's tropical storms. So you know the the hurricane season is starting in the, the southern Atlantic. And we get the edges of those still hitting us in the Arctic. So, you know, we'll have a couple of calm days and then it just, it's so, so wavy that the ship is just going up and down. It's a, it's a roller coaster you can't get off. Um, and hopefully it only lasts for a day and sometimes it lasts for two or three. So it can get, um, can get uncomfortable, but um, we're never, you know, the, the captains are always experienced. They've been up there before many times. They've been on, they've got experience on a number of vessels. Um, so I've never felt unsafe as far as that went. And the simplest thing we can do, you know, you always think about it's a big storm, let's run for port. We go offshore. Uh, we get away from rocks, we get away from land, and we just ride it out, point the bow into the waves, and you just sort of bob for however long it takes. Uh, the other question, so odd things coming out of trawls? Yeah. Um, I haven't really had any really surprising species. You know, we get some things that are, pretty cool. Like we get redfish, which are like a really big red bass. So if you think of a bass, you catch in fresh water. Uh, same shape of animal, but but they're bright red. Uh, they're common at the south end of our range, but we've caught a couple at a, up at Pond Inlet, the top end of Baffin Island. And so it's like the, it's the extent they're, they're pushing as far as the, the range that we know that they're in. So that's, you know, again, new records in a new area. 
Um, so it was surprising we saw them, and no small ones, just really big ones. Uh, but really, the weirdest one was again at Pond Inlet. We we trawled, and it came up that we thought we had a small Greenland shark coiled up in the in the bottom, and it turned out we caught a tractor tire, and we pulled a tractor tire. So here we up, you know, north of Baffin Island, and here's a tractor tire. There's no farms around, so it, it must have been from an ice camp or a piece of equipment used in town for maintaining roads, and we pulled it out. The, there was, of course, there's no rim, it's just the rubber. And the inside of it, it was full of Greenland halibut. They'd, they'd moved, whether they were there when we caught the tire or if they did it while they were in the net on, while it was coming up. But, you know, with we were standing there and we pulled about a dozen Greenland halibut out of the inside of this tire, which was just the weirdest thing. All right, pretty cool. Uh, coming in on YouTube, there's a question from Evan in Calgary, and he's wondering how COVID's impacting your work right now. Yeah, so um, obviously I'm doing this from my bedroom instead of my office. Uh, so there, there's definitely changes. We didn't do any field work this year. Uh, DFO chose not. We have a few people that are that live permanently in Iqaluit and other places in the Arctic. So those people stayed up in, in Iqaluit and none of it had no cases of, cases of COVID until the last month. Uh, so they were doing pretty well, but none of us from the South traveled up. It was just a, a very early decision we're not going to do it. So our offshore survey didn't happen. Our surveys at Pond Inlet, Kikatarjwak, Clyde River didn't happen. Uh, we were able to keep a few programs going by contracting people in communities. And fortunately, we we typically go someplace and we work for at least you know three to five years, working with the same people ideally. And so you know, and we're always training. I mean, we always it's never just DFO staff. We always hire people from town as part of the research team. So we're training them how to do it. And having done a number of programs in communities, you know, this, I'm not the only researcher, so there's a bunch of us that are doing it. There are people that, that now have a lot of experience doing a, a variety of our scientific sampling. Pretty much anyone from the communities knows how to hunt and fish. So they're safe on the water. They know how to, they're very practical. They know how to handle, handle gear. Uh, the training was more about using specific instruments to collect oceanographic data. Um, we didn't do any fish tagging this year uh, through that, but we still had a lot of samples and other information collected through contracts. Uh, and we did have, for the fish tracking work, one of my colleagues did go on a cruise. The, they used a, a fishing boat. They got on in Newfoundland and went up and did some tagging and turned over some of our moorings in Baffin Bay, but went nowhere near near land. Like they, they took everything they needed. They were gone for six weeks at sea. Um, did all the work in, in one trip. No one flew in, no one flew out. They were just an isolated vessel uh, and then came back and uh, still had to quarantine for two weeks when they got back to Ontario. So we didn't do a lot um, and everything, the little we did do, we had to do in different ways. All right. Uh, million dollar question here. We have uh, our class in Godrich. They are grade 11. So they're thinking about, you know, future careers and what they might want to do after high school. So they're curious about, you know, what kind of salary, you don't have to go into too much detail, but <laughs> what kind of salary did you expect if, it, you know, you pursued a route of fisheries and, and conservation? Yeah, so it, uh, it you know, the, the, the scapegoat answer is it, it depends. Uh, for DFO, you know, the, the salaries are pretty decent and we get health care and other benefits as well. Uh, there are, and there's a number of jobs. So like I'm here as a research scientist with a PhD. Uh, people with a master's or just a bachelor's degree uh, get hired as biologists. So, uh, and then we have technicians as well. And we hire a lot of people as students. We hire a lot of people as casuals that are here for like 90 days in a year. Uh, a lot of different different ways to do it. Uh, but for, you know, once you're if you're hired as a as a biologist or a scientist, um, you know, starting salaries somewhere around for biologists is around sixty thousand uh, dollars and goes up to about 80 uh, scientists, it starts a little higher and goes a little higher. Um, you, you can make more than $100,000 as a scientist in a year once you've been here for a, for a little while. And, uh, and technicians are more in the you know, 40 to 60, $70,000 range. Uh, all of the salaries are, are available online. Um, so you can look them up for the federal public service. And, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's a situation of where once you're, a lot of people move around, so they'll get a job with and not even just within DFO, like Environment Canada does, does a lot of similar work, or sorry, Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, and once you're in the federal government, we're I'm not hired by DFO, I'm hired by the government of Canada, by Treasury Board. 
And so you can transfer to a different department. Um, you can go to Environment Canada, you can go to Parks, you can go to Transport Canada. Uh, a lot of people move around, try different things. It's a, it's a very open world in which to work. All right, very cool. I want to start out with a shout out to our YouTube crew. Thank you so much for the classrooms who joined and sent us in some questions. Thank you to our camera classrooms from British Columbia and Alberta and Ontario. It was great to, to see you and hear some of your questions. And Kevin, thank you for joining us on the World Fisheries Day and sharing uh, some of your work in the North. My pleasure. All right. Well, again, a shout out to everybody. I hope you enjoy the rest of your week and thanks for joining us today. Have a great night, everyone. Take care, everyone.